Hello and welcome to the seven panel reflection sessions sponsored by the Catholic Bishops of Alberta and the Northwest Territories. My name is Lincoln Ho and I'm the communications coordinator at the Archdiocese of Edmonton and also the social media um, specialist at Grandin Media who is hosting this meeting. And it is my pleasure to uh, serve as the moderator for today's panel. Uh, so today's panel is the healthy use of information technologies. And it's a series of reflections uh, inspired by the pastoral letter um, that the bishops issued a few weeks ago called Save Your People, O Lord, and Bless Your Inheritance, a pastoral statement on the impact of COVID-19 and the call to Christian renewal. Um, in the pastoral letter, um, the bishops invite everybody in the province um, to review the impact of COVID-19 within their homes and communities and schools and workplaces, um, especially in light of the gospel and social teaching of the church. Um, so think about, you know, have you lived your faith during this time of pandemic? Which values, attitudes, behaviors have been most dear to you? Um, and which ones are in need of remedy and renewal? Uh, so those are some so those are some questions um, you might be thinking about or themes that we'll be thinking about um, today. Uh, and today's special topic, of course, is the healthy use of technologies, uh, information technologies, which has kept everybody connected, of course. Uh, and to, so I'll just introduce our panel quickly here. Uh, so we have Tim Spelsey, uh, and he is the media relations expert and retired VP of Global Edmonton. Welcome. Uh, we have uh, Father Feroz, sorry, we have Father Feroz Fernandez. Uh, he's an author, blogger, pastor of Holy Family Parish in Grimshaw, Alberta. Welcome. Uh, we, uh, uh, sadly, we are going to miss um, Miss Chelsea Marshall. Um, from CCSD, uh, she is currently sick right now, so our prayers with her, are with her. But she has um, got a replacement uh, for us today, so uh, we welcome John Wash, uh, director of Catholicity at CCSD as well. And then we have Constable Twain Nguyen, uh, the Cyber Crimes Investigations Unit of Edmonton Police Service. Welcome. Okay, so um, I guess before we begin, um, we'll start with a quick word of prayer. Uh, so in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, uh, Father God, we just um, ask that um, your spirit is among us this morning. Um, in, and since you are the God of time and space, that uh, we ask that you're present with each one of us in our spaces here at home and also uh, in our offices and to all of those that are watching uh, later on that uh, you are present in that time as well and that uh, your Holy Spirit will move each one of us uh, to respond uh, in faith uh, to what's happening around the world right now and for our neighbors. Uh, we pray especially for Ch Chelsea this morning um, as she's sick um, that um, you bring your healing upon her um, and your protection upon her as well. Um, so uh, we pray for um, the saints of information and te technologies and uh, the internet and, and um, you know, different uh, communications um, uh, persons. So St. Francis uh, de Sales um, and blessed, um, the new, the new uh, saint that uh, has just been, um, beatified and uh we just uh pray that uh, you pray for us as well um in the name of the father and the son and the holy spirit amen okay uh so i'd like to start by quoting the bishop's reflection text on today's theme uh so our bishops write one of the greatest blessings uh to surface during the pandemic time has been the use of various communication technologies to help bridge physical distances and to keep people connected through time and space employed creativity employed creatively by individuals families schools workplaces churches and many others these various means of technology literally transformed our world and allowed us to continue life with a remarkable degree of connectivity as we continue to use all means of information technology available for us today. It is important to also be prudent in our use of these technologies to ensure that they do not give, uh, give rise to destructive situations or behaviors. 
At times, this may require us to refrain from the techno technological imperative that suggests that if we can use it, we must. It may also require us to limit or restrict our access on certain platforms or to exercise prudent discernment with respect to information that is presented. The essential question to ask in our use of communication technology is whether it contributes to the betterment of the human person and human community. Okay. Um, so I guess um, we'll actually start with uh, Constable Nguyen. Um, you know, during this time, actually before this time, uh, technology has a lot of the times uh, been seen in a poor light, like especially social media. Um, in terms of um, your perspective from the Edmonton Police Service, um, how, how do you, how do you like, examine all this? Um, first of all, I, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of technology. I've always been, it's one of the draw uh, for me. So when, when I was asked to join, uh, Cyber, I was like, that's I, like that was exactly like my dream thing to do um, as as part of my uh, daily living. I enjoy uh, using technology, and then to be incorporating it into my work, it's it's fantastic. So uh, yes, there's uh, technology is a wonderful communication and uh, idea of having information right right at hand is. Fantastic. It comes with anything. Uh, it comes with some drawback. And the way I approach technology is as a tool. And for my job, it has always been a tool. Even before this, uh, all the recent, I joined EPS in 2007. So all the stuff we have now weren't there. But I always thought that if you can implement technology as a tool to enhance what you do, it only benefits, but like any tools, like when I'm trained as a police officer, I have a lot of responsibility. My tools could be my sidearm or any of my additional weapons. Those comes with responsibility I have to take care of. So I approach technology in that sense. Uh, and, and because of that, it, you need to have some good foundation stuff that comes along with using those tools. So I think a, uh, your life in light of all the bad media about technology. That's what happened when you don't apply technology to with some fundamental idea behind it and understanding the impact and the reach of it. So as a police officer, I like using technology because it's being used by, uh, you know, people with, uh, uh, you know, the bad guys, say the bad guys, or the people that want to do harm, it's being used by them. So as a, as a law enforcement officer, I want to understand the technology. I want to be able to use the technology and track or even capture or capture the evidence that I need to bring these guys to court. Um, so it's very important for me, I think very important for anybody in this day and age to understand that technology has advanced and uh, like exponentially, and if we if we don't take time to you know understand that type of impact, then yeah, we are left with uh, uh, a lot of uh, possibility of doing harm to others, and also having us exposed to those harm. So I'm not sure if that's the kind of question you're looking for, but in our field, like in my job, I, I use it to. Um, do my job because it's the only way that I can uh, track or find the culprit behind some of these crimes. And if I don't understand that, I don't know where to start. So it's, it's very important for me. And I don't shy away from it. I think I, I embrace it in many sense. But there's a distinction between it, me recognizing that it is one of my tools that I have on my belt. And so I have to apply it that way. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of your job, uh, I guess it's pretty hard to uh, let your faith uh, come through, I, I'm, I'm assuming, uh, but um, connecting it with, I guess, cyber crimes and um, I, I guess um, so criminology, 
Um, have you seen the use of technology um, by faith groups um, to, you know, I guess, reduce crime in the community? Um, um, maybe like connecting with um, youth uh, that are, that are um, I guess, uh, at risk? You know what, that's, uh, uh, let's do answer your question about um, faith in my job. And I think, uh, I think the faith that I uh, have uh, being a Catholic is a wonderful background and a wonderful foundation for me to do my job. Um, if anything, it, it makes me a stronger uh, police officer in the sense that all you have to do is understand those fundamental things that built you as a Catholic and apply that because that gives you that grounding foundation to do your job. It's very, very simple. It's all written there. You understand the scripture, understand that and apply it. It's, it's there. The guiding, the guiding principles are the same. As a police officer, I have to meet certain criteria in terms of the evidence and certain a certain um, presentation of uh, what is threshold for me to delay charge or what's threshold for me to arrest somebody. Those, those are my job that I have to find. But in terms of the guiding principle of moral and ethical decision, being a Catholic really helps you have that grounding foundation. And to answer your second question about technology and its use in outreach to youth and etc. I think it's wonderful because it, I'll give you an example. Some of the communication we have with our youth, it's not through the phone because it's almost like picking up a call and calling to talk to a youth, that, whether they're the complainant or whether they're suspect. It's very difficult because they don't do that anymore. You either text them or send a message through different various app. So, uh, that's 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 a very very you know modern thing to to understand. It's not the same thing as before, where I can simply call and you know usually when I do that I just get uh, you know I, I get no response. But a simple text or a simple reach out uh, via various different communication, I usually get a response. So it's interesting in that sense. There's a wonderful community in terms of. Uh, people uh, that, that do things to help. Um, for example, let's, let's give you an example. A colleague of mine, uh, barely heavily involved in the bike index, and there is a wonderful group of um, cyclists out there that look after each other and on good faith uh, do that through technology in, in helping retrieve stolen bike or retrieve uh, bikes that are found and it's a great community, and that's that's all I've done outside police. They just they it's a community they use technology um, to do that. I don't know if that really answers your question, but I think that understanding understanding where we are as as faith believe and and the nature of us, and being able to uh, give us grounded and using again technology as a tool to to allow us to reach out and communicate with other people. I think. Nothing wrong with that. So, oh, very great initiatives. Uh, actually, I've never heard of the bike initiative before. So, yeah, it's uh, the bike group is a wonderful group. Like that's just an example of that, and it's again built on on citizens and people community who care for what they love, and they just they share that information, and it's a great way. Again, this initiative that they they work with. And, and through them and through Bike Index, which is a nonprofit organization, have retrieved many, many bikes. For example, like police, we, you know, we recover a lot of stolen bike. And a lot of time, it's very difficult for us to track those bike as to who it belongs to. And it ends up, unfortunately, it ends up into an auction block because no one claims for it. No one even knows they, they've lost a bike or how they claim for it or how we can tie that bike. But through these organizations that's using technology, we're able to return these bikes to these people uh, who uh, it's sometimes it's their only main of transportation. And it's, it's a wonderful thing to do. So. Mm -hmm.
Very cool. Um, we'll uh, switch over to Father Feroz here. Um, what do you think of these community initiatives um, during this time of COVID right now? Well, there are lots of community initiatives that happen just because of COVID. I would say that um, from the, my perspective, I was quite impressed to hear from the perspective of the crimes uh, and the positive initiatives that are taken. But uh, from the side of the priest, I was uh, surprised how the priest, uh, even the of different age groups, went into technology to engage with, uh, with the community. And some of them were senior priests uh, who really struggled with, uh, with technology. And um, those were like, priests became uh, content creators online. So that was like, you know, like they create content, like, you know, create homilies, talks, reflections, but creating content online, it was a new, new, new element that I saw across a trend across uh, the globe and especially in our country. Uh, another thing that the priest started to do is take this as an opportunity to connect with family and friends and their people. I remember interviewing or talking to some of my priest colleagues in this diocese in Gruard McLennan. Uh, Monsignor Charles, uh, initially in the first one, first week of, he had a Zoom mass with his family. Like Zoom was, could be done, but pandemic brought this opportunity. So, and uh, even uh, Archbishop started the glass door campaign to connect people, collect their email so that we can reach that people. So this was a quite a new initiative that priests became content creators. And another thing was very interesting was uh, being very conscious about promoting good content online. Like many of the churches have Facebook and uh, the promotion of good content, like forwarding good content to its members in the social network community uh, became an, another type of a practice that came in. Uh, yeah. Very good. Uh, yeah, especially the the priestess content creators. Um, you know, as a social media person myself, uh, I was completely shocked by how well one of our priests at St. John Bosco Parish um, did his live streams early, early on. Uh, he was able to figure out like Facebook stickers that, and he used them as banners uh, for the church on his live streams and. Uh, if he wasn't a priest, I think he could take my job away. So that was pretty <laughs> cool. Um, so, uh, Tim, uh, in terms of a media perspective, um, mm -hmm. you know, obviously, you know, in traditional media, um, the, this kind of uh, thing has, I don't think it's ever happened, um, where the entire world is affected by one, one specific thing, um, other than maybe like a big, big event like 9-11. Uh, but uh, as, a, as a person of faith, uh, looking at how media is covering uh, some of these initiatives um, and how it's connecting people, uh, especially with um, the light of misinformation, um, mm -hmm. how are you um, seeing this from there? Well, there's a lot of really great things that are going on in the media right now. I mean, I, I, uh, I've kept in touch with a lot of my former colleagues and it's, it's a struggle for them, I must say, Lincoln, because, first of all, there's a lot of people working from home in the media business and uh, 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 fewer people in the office. And so there's, you know, that kind of misconnection, which is, which is a bit of a struggle for them. The other part of it, I guess, is it's, it's the same story over and over and over again, but, it, but it's so critically important that they have to cover and update it. So you talk about, yeah, 9-11, which affected the whole world, or you think of big stories you know, here in Edmonton, like the Black Friday tornado. But those were incidents that had a kind of a time frame to them. Here we are in something that's been, what, seven, eight months, and, and probably is, well, recently is almost been escalating in terms of the pandemic impact here in Alberta, and no end in sight. So it's a, an incredibly difficult story to tell, to cover, and, and to be careful about because you want to be, uh, you don't want to be alarmist on one hand, and yet you don't want to underplay it on the on the other hand. And so, trying to keep all that information and and try to find new ways to tell the story to keep the public interest is a huge challenge. And we talked earlier about, you know, what's happening with social media and the fake information or the fake news. There's so much of that on social media and and on illegitimate news sites. So the legitimate news organizations 
like Global News or CTV or the General Calgary Herald, you know, those are the locations you should be going to to get the legitimate news story because anybody can sit out there and, and create a, a, a site that looks like it's a legitimate news source and it starts getting quoted on Facebook. I mean, somebody told me the other day that it was, it was put out on Facebook that anyone who was diagnosed with COVID, that tested positive for COVID, would lose their, their health coverage in Canada, which of course is totally, totally false. But one person puts it out there and then a bunch of people repost it. Did you see this? Did you see this? And the next thing you know, you've got a bunch of people believing something that's totally false. So that's the other challenge faced by the media. And I know it's, it's, uh, it's really been tough for them. And of course, at the same time too, there are you know, safety precautions in the office like every other office that they, have to, that they have to follow. And we've had a few situations, I know with my, my former colleagues at Global TV where someone isn't feeling well, well then they have to stay home and make sure that they're okay. So you're missing a lot of, of people at, at the office as well. So I think the media has done a really good job. The mainstream media, the conventional media has done a tremendous job. They've taken a lot of criticism because a lot of people feel they're, they're overreacting to the story, but they're not. I think the coverage has been solid and, and, and honest and accurate. And I think they deserve a lot of credit for an exceptional job um, under difficult circumstances. I'm a little biased about that, but I do know so many people are out there saying, oh, the media is, is, has, has, has exaggerated this. And we know that they have it. I remember one friend of mine wrote me a note in the early stages of the pandemic because the media was calling this a, quote, deadly virus. And he said, it's not going to be a deadly virus. And that was probably back in February. Well, look where we are today. It's, it's a deadly virus. Hmm. Um, and in terms of um, responding as a Catholic, I think, it, I think my question is sort of linked to this, the sort of linked to the misinformation um, and also the fundamentalism that's happening. Um, you know, like when you look at the Catholic church um, from last year or the last two years, mm -hmm. uh, the biggest, the biggest news story is the abuse scandal and, you know, and, and, Catholics responding um, in a in a good way. It, it's sometimes hard to respond to it. Uh, but in terms of the pandemic, um, it seems like some of the fundamentalism um, from faith groups uh, is going into that corner of you know anti mask and anti uh, and in in a way I think I see it as uh, something that's anti faith uh, in terms of our respect for human life. Um, how do you, how do you respond to something like that as a Catholic? Well, I mean, yeah, you're absolutely right. There have been uh, some, what I would call religious groups on the far right that have been very anti-mask and, you know, free speech and our rights and everything like that. But of course, uh, wearing a mask, being, taking all the other precautions and protocols is very much part of our faith because we really have to look after each other. What we're doing out there right now in terms of, keeping our distance, wearing a mask, keeping our hands clean. It's not so much concerned about ourselves. That's part of the issue, but it's concerned for everybody else. This is our mission. This is, this is what we must do. And, and also, you know, it's also uh, important to us in, in our faith to, to let's be accurate, let's be calm, and let's make sure that the information that we share all the time, let's make sure the information we share is accurate. And if we're not sure of its accuracy, don't share it. Don't retweet it. Don't post it. Don't tell your neighbors about it. You know, make sure that you that you are accurate in all the information you share. If you're not sure, don't say anything. So those are important things in, in terms of our faith and what's going on with the information that's uh, being shared out there. Unfortunately, because there's oh, there's so much there's so much misinformation, and it's uh, and it's that's where that's where we lead to these anti mass situations and 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 people getting into fights. I've seen videos of people fighting in stores and everything like that, because aside from what you should do, if, if, if someone is saying, hey, to come into this store, to come into this business, you have to wear a mask you, and you choose not to wear a mask, well, then just don't go in. It's just like going into someone's house and they say, take off your shoes when you come in the house, please. You respect their rules. You respect that it's their house. And, it, and it's exactly the same uh, for everything that we're doing right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, I completely respect and applaud um, how the bishops have handled the situation so far in terms of our own churches, because I don't believe there's any cases uh, connected to a Catholic church at the moment. I could be wrong, uh, but, um, but there have been some cases at schools. Um, so, John, um, in terms of getting back to some sort of normal um, at the moment, um, 
and balancing that out with the pandemic, um, how does Catholic teaching come into play here? Well, you know, uh, first, I, I guess I'd say that uh, normal is always a relative phrase and kind of what we're accepting now as normal now wasn't normal five years ago. And in hindsight, we'll look back on this too and say, well, you know, normal, normal will, will evolve and change as we go along. I guess, you know, um, in, in Catholic schools, um, we're always, we're always interested in, in uh, serving our students and helping them come to a better understanding of themselves as creations of God, right? Coming, uh, bringing them into relationship with Jesus Christ is the best thing we can hope to do. Um, there, there's no question COVID's kind of changed things up a bit and there, there are always these concerns regarding, um, safety, but I, I wouldn't say that we're, we're any less concerned about safety now than we were before, right? It's just what elements of safety are you concerned about? We've always been concerned with the safety of our students. We'll always continue to be, um, you, you know, some of the other commentators here have, have, have spoken about, um, community. And I think Catholic schools are really, really special places to create community. And that time period earlier this spring, where we weren't able to gather as school communities, that was really hard. It was really hard on, on our students. It was hard on our families and it was hard on our staff, because I think we all have this great longing to be together and to support each other. And I think, you know, the, the advantage of technology is that it's it's giving us new ways to do that where we don't necessarily have to be physically present with each other to do it um with all the cautions therein i think i think there's an inherent goodness in us wanting to be together and wanting to be connected so lincoln i'm not sure that really answers your question yeah it it does (laughs) and it brings us back to the topic of technology um i know this this is directed to anybody um, who wants to answer the question but um you know, obviously technology has connected us through Zoom calls and everything like that. And But some people have that um, Zoom fatigue um, and they do want to meet with people. Uh, and mm-hmm. there there has been, uh, I, I don't know how true it is in Alberta, but there has been some reports of increased uh, suicide rates because everybody's isolated. Um, in terms of isolation, um, how can technology um, give that human touch to people? Well, let me jump in on that one. I'm, I'm sure everybody has an opinion on it. It's, I mean, the, the great thing about the technology is that we can keep in touch with people during this pandemic. And if this had happened 20 or 25 years ago, an event like this, a Zoom call or a FaceTime chat wouldn't have happened. So in some ways, it's really improved. It. And, and, and in, in my situation, it's kind of opened my eyes to video calling. Our, our son lives in Halifax. We used to phone him every couple of weeks. Now we're doing video chats with him so we can see how long his hair's got or how big his beard's got or something like that. So there's, there's all the, the, the upside of that, but, but and people working from home and that's a good thing, I guess, because uh, we can keep, uh, we, we can keep their jobs going and their industry or their enterprise going, even though they have to work, you know, stay home and, 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 and isolate for people during the pandemic. But on the other hand, it, it can become too normal. As you mentioned, the zoom fatigue, a zoom meeting is great, but it's not like meeting in person watching mass online is, is really a great thing that's happened during this pandemic. And that's been a nice thing that's been able to be provided at a very, very reasonable cost, but it's not the same as going to mass and, and the fellowship that you enjoy on your way in, on your way out of the church. And and the same thing with zoom meetings, you know, I, I often find with the organizations that I work with like covenant health and Fort Edmonton, sometimes the most important part of the meeting is what happens when you arrive before the meeting starts or during the lunch break or the coffee break. And those are the things we're missing. And and my concern, Lincoln, is that I I think that uh, all this technology, while it's great on one hand, it could also be adding to socialization in the long term. If people keep working from home and they don't go in that collaborative state, if they're in this house and these four walls all the time. And so there is that issue of social isolation getting worse in a lot of situations the technology was already kind of contributing to and i think it's ramped up a little bit during this pandemic and hopefully when we're back to normal uh, all the people that worked in offices go back to their offices i know a lot of people that worked from home who, who loved it for the first two or three weeks or two or three months and then it was like get me out of here i gotta get back to the office 
Um, I, and um, I guess this one is uh, directed to Father Throws. Um, mm-hmm. In terms of social isolation, uh, you know, and people continuing to work at home, I think this might be a future trend. Um, how does evangelization come into play here when people don't see each other? You don't bump into anybody at the grocery store really that much anymore either. Um, like there's less gathering places like malls and um, and churches, like people aren't coming to church. How does evangelization come into play here? I'm so happy that you use the word evangelization uh, because that's something that is core of my responsibility. And uh, that's why I like to frame this uh, whole question uh, or respond to it in this uh, three words. Uh, the two powerful words that are used in the pastoral letter is uh, to encourage and to engage. And I, I would uh, use your word of evangelize. So like, you no, know, this situation as uh, this fatigue is coming, media fatigue is coming of passive consumers. The moment you become more and more passive consumer, you become fatigued about Zoom and every social media. But when you become an active in encouraging, in engaging and in evangelizing, there is a whole new dynamism that comes. Now, we need to encourage people who are already in the church. They are part of our institution. They are like, we call them practicing Catholic. We need to engage with people who are like on the periphery. And uh, that those are the challenges that uh, this... Uh, this is one alternative for fatigue or stress or uh, all other uh, negative effects of online communications. And the third very important aspect is to evangelize, to be uh, promoters of good news, to promote inspiration, promote hope. Uh, these are for across our boundaries of those who identify themselves as Catholic. So evangelization is you are expressing your joy to be happy follower of Jesus Christ. What is evangelization is basically you are expressing you are so joyful that you want to tell others it is, this is something great. Like, you know, you check up an app on the social media. You say, oh, check this app. You know, this can do this thing. This can do this thing. We constantly tweet it on Instagram, YouTube, oh, check my video, check this, check this. Evangelization is check out Jesus Christ. He's interesting. And when we engage in this type of uh, method, it's a paradigm. We don't neglect anybody. And I I, seriously, I want to mention that we need to keep encouraging people who are already in us, with us, engage with people who are just falling out on the periphery. Uh, Tell them like, no, uh, because sometimes they get led away by the noise that media creates. And the third part is uh, engagement and uh, evangelization. Evangelization, I want to add, that this is a whole opportunity to use uh, a modern technology to engage, uh, encourage, and evangelize uh, indigenous communities. Uh, Very, very good point. I love the joy part. Um, In in terms of evangelization, I think a lot of Catholics um, especially um, are, are, are... shy, I guess, um, of evangelizing themselves. They kind of expect a priest to do the job. How do you encourage um, regular everyday Catholics to evangelize right now? Because it's the most important part of uh, our faith. You know, this is something that uh, that comes up again and again. Uh, as part of my personal practice, I, I do make these very concrete, conscious announcements. I, I tell people, what is evangelization? Evangelization is that when you tell what God has done to you in your life, to others, Mm -hmm. that is evangelization. You don't feel shy what God has done for you in your life. And that is the vibrancy of faith. Faith gets promoted when you experience God's presence in your life. When you experience the spirit moving you in your life. And you have nothing but to tell to tell it to others. It's like I'm just telling you. I'm just putting this as the very crude analogy of discovering a new app to do something wonderful. Very good. You don't you don't shy away from it. Like you no, know, you got something and you want to tell the world uh, this is something very interesting. 
Okay. And uh, in fact, uh, that is one of the key reasons which I share these uh, as announcement is because I said we are all the time talking about declining numbers. Uh, mm -hmm. See, we don't go by numbers, uh, but I said, when was the last time that you spoke about your faith to your own family? When was the last time that you spoke about your something about your faith community to somebody else? When was the last time? So I think that those are, are engaging opportunities for evangelization. And I, I, I think lots of people are doing it and have been doing it. But sometimes these uh, reminders do not come on time. And I think the priests also have to constantly encourage uh, the people, the congregation, to share their faith, sharing their faith, in just not just come them call them for mass. It's just not about that. That is one primary responsibility to join those things, but to discover the person of Christ, and that response is on them, on the discoverer. It's not on you. Your job is to promote, to share the joy that you have been experiencing as you practice your faith. And for me, that is the most primacy of faith. All gospel is filled with that. They went out and told others what Christ has done to them. So when we go out, the last statement of the, of the mass is they go, go in peace. Uh, the mass is ended, or you, you may say it in different words. It's like to go to tell the other part of the mass, to tell it to others what has happened. Thank you. Um, I think um, I, I, I took the word sharing your faith literally. Um, and as somebody like everybody who uses social media, sharing is something that everybody does on social media. So it should be like second nature for us to share our faith. Um, and, uh, and especially within our own families, um, that, that was a very great point. Um, how about um, for those who are marginalized, this, this question is for anybody, uh, for those who are marginalized or who aren't connected to, uh, you know, our digital technology, um, how does other technology, maybe old technology, um, uh, help us to connect with those people? Lincoln, maybe I'll jump in on this one here. Um, certainly, you know, one of, the, one of the things we're concerned with is this idea of equity of access. And mm -hmm. I think when we talk about, uh, you know, being able to use the, the tools to sort of mediate our connection with one another, we're always concerned when someone's left behind, right? So the, the idea of isolation is, is a problem for us and uh, kind of, uh, um, I'll, I'll throw my parent hat on here for a second. I, uh, I have four of my own children living at home with me right now. And so uh, we are a family of six in a 1400 square foot bungalow. And in March, all of us were either going to school or working from home. We spent a good chunk of the day trying to hide from each other. Everybody trying to find a quiet corner in the house to go do their work. Right. And one of the things we had to do right away was increase bandwidth into our house. And I was thinking, well, that's great. That works really well for us. How is this working for some of our other marginalized communities and people out there? And so as a school district, we looked at, at, at doing things like we lent out um, our supply of Chromebooks, of edge connection devices to families that had internet access, but not necessarily a device for every child to participate in those kinds of things. So we were lending out technology and then that's, the, that's kind of an initiative that continues, trying to make sure that people have access that way. But even then, you're only helping people that have the internet connection right to their house. There are people that don't have that as well. So we're still using our traditional ways of sort of communicating. We're still using newsletters. We're still using phone calls. We're still trying to make sure that, you know, we're engaging with everybody. We talk about this kind of, uh, this idea that, you know, the, the only thing worse than being left behind is the idea that no one's coming to look for you, right? And it's that idea of looking for the lost sheep we're in the people business. We're about connecting with each other. And so we're always looking for any way we can do it. Um, if we need to write a letter, we'll do it because we got to stay in touch with people. For, for sure. Uh, yep. Go ahead. Go ahead I, I just want to add to what uh, John Walsh has said. 
uh, we are using old technology, uh, the old means of like telephone. I, I remember when the pandemic started, as Bishop Petipa started this glass door campaign, and a, every parish had to give like five or six volunteers to reach out to the parishioners by a phone call. And these phone calls were pretty interesting. The feedback that we got from all these volunteers were people were happy to just engage in conversation. They were coming to the same church, but they never had a conversation more than a minute or two. And that element of getting connected to that 20 or 30 percent of people who do not have internet do not access an email or uh, who some of them uh, are okay with telephone uh, but some of them are not accessible like you know we do print those things and therefore uh, when this pandemic started i immediately collected uh, all the emails of the parishioners so that i can write an email every week as like a love letter to all my people you know, like there are so many positive options and as uh, john said like there are a few copies that uh, we do have to print because people who do not have any of those things, we are missing those things. And that is a segment of people that is most neglected when this, the emergence of uh, technology. And it worries me a little bit uh, because we are not reaching out to those people who do not have access to technology. So we are like, you no know, lagging behind to communicate faith to them in such times, which is very critical. Thank you, thank you. Mm, think, for sure. Uh, if I could just jump in there, I think the greatest concern in talking about marginalized and there's different populations that Father was talking about, John was talking about, is, is of course our senior population, uh, those especially in, in extended care or seniors facilities who face the problem of socialization all the time, well before the pandemic, and the pandemic has just made it 10 times worse, maybe 100 times worse, in many of these facilities, no visitors are allowed, no family coming in to help them, understandably, because uh, there's such a threat of COVID and there's been some you know, serious outbreaks in, across the province of some of these facilities. So how can, we, how can we connect with the seniors? Can you make a phone call? Uh, can you send a card? Uh, I've been phoning some, some people I know that live in senior centers or even live on their own, but are, are, are in their 70s or 80s, late 70s or 80s, and just trying to do a check-in once in a while. I think that's really important. And, and these people, you get them on the phone and you're, you're on the phone for half an hour. They're, they're so happy to hear from someone, Father, as you mentioned, you all of a sudden get a, a phone call or even a card There's, or, 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 or send them something in the mail. Um, so you can use those other technologies. But I think right now during this time, it's just so incredibly important that we check in on people. And even beyond the seniors, even, even our own uh, contemporaries, I think every once in a while, maybe you got to pick one or two people a week that you're just going to check on it. How are you doing? Because I do believe the, the isolation and, and, and the mental health of everyone during this pandemic has been affected. Everyone is facing some mental health challenges, not just seniors and not just people that are totally isolated, but we're all facing some challenges. And there's got to be a way that you make a connection and it might be going above and beyond. Just sending out an email or a text uh, isn't going to cut it in a lot of situations. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Um, like uh, in terms of uh, technology and the marginalized, I used to work at the homeless shelter and Canada, oh, the homeless in Canada, um, it, it's a different thing because you don't see anywhere else uh, homeless people with cell phone plans because that's the only way they can get like a job or, or something like that. Um, and uh, what about like people that are completely um, disassociated from society like prisoners um, is there any sort of way that we can use technology either crowdsourcing or whatnot or, or connecting other people uh, to reach out to those um, very specific uh, marginalized groups can i can i add something i think uh, this issue uh, is to be addressed uh, from a very local perspective because uh, this issue is like, I'll quote an example in our, in our community here. The churches here, just before the pandemic, got together to start a food bank in Grimshaw. And the moment we started a food bank, it picked up and the pandemic came and then people were donating like across uh, the, the faith communities, were donating to this food bank. And food bank became uh, the great distribution point for those struggling, those marginalized, those groups who are homeless. 
and uh, the food bank is still doing well. I think uh, one of the great response to address this issue of homelessness, people who are uh, struggling, really struggling, and they are shy to come forward to a larger community is to have this access point of a food bank. Uh, that's one example that happened in our community. I know across Canada, there are so many initiatives like that, but I feel uh, being local to address these issues is much more effective than to be on a bigger scale, probably. Mm -hmm. um, has any, does anybody have any um, specific questions or lessons they've learned from um, how technology plays a role in faith? I think uh, technology, again, uh, is great to help us connect during these times, but at the, at the end of the day, I have to, I have to say it's something that it's not, you can't replace. Um, when we weren't able to attend mass and, you know, technology allow us to attend mass and the, the positive part of that was allow us to see the mass of different uh, part of the world where, you know, my family and I would, on Sunday, would try mass down uh, in the States or somewhere else. And it was neat. It was neat to see how some of that uh, is done through other part of the world. And it's also neat because you realize it doesn't matter where you are in the world, the masks are the same, right? It gives, and my kids got to see that example and said, you know, kids, we're not here in Canada anymore, but we're here in the States or we're here in uh, New Zealand or Australia. But look at the masks, it's still the same, right? So it's, it's kind of neat that way for them to see uh, our faith and how it is throughout the world. Uh, but I, I find it difficult because you can't, you can't replace that. The community, part of our faith is community. And the physicality of being in, in, in communion and in, in church is, I think, gives us that, um, you know, something that can't be replaced by virtual, can't be replaced by video streaming. It helps alleviate some of that. But I think you have to, you have to take that with, uh, you know, uh, a bit of uh, understanding that, that fact that uh, we're, we're a community of faith and, and at the end of the day, uh, the virtual can only carry so far and then we do need to have the presence of the community and the church is not replaceable in that sense. So. Uh, and let me just follow up on that. That's so correct. That, 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 I guess the, the upside has been that the, the live stream masses and the online masses have been so available from all around the world. And we've watched mass from Halifax, from New York City, from Rome. And, and you think about uh, people that are in our senior facilities, because I think this is something that has to come out of the pandemic, just how we look after our, our senior and aging population. Um, this has made the, the, the issue more urgent. But for example, a lot of seniors' homes, you know, there'll be a priest that'll come in maybe uh, once or twice a month to say mass. But now maybe there's the possibility of having uh, an online service in a television room or a meeting room and putting it up on a big screen TV every day. So those people can kind of take in a mass every day, albeit virtually most of the time, but there can be a mass a service every day and a gathering of, of those people in the senior centers uh, to, to take that in. That could be a real positive. Father mentioned about sending out this, uh, this love letter to all his parishioners uh, every week. I think that's a fantastic idea. In our parish, the bulletin, of course, is, is not being published right now. It's not available at the church because they don't want to hand out the paper. And maybe that's good for the environment as well. We're saving the paper and the ink. Uh, you can go online and get the bulletin, but I'm wondering why we don't build a database at the church. It wouldn't be all that complicated and be sending that bulletin out to all the parishioners every week. Instead of, don't wait for them to check it out on the website because they might remember some Sunday, they might not. But this would be a great way of, of reaching those people who don't come every Sunday. You know, we have a we have a, a newsletter from the Archdiocese every week. Why not something from our own parish every week and make it local, local, local? And you also mentioned, Father, the, the, the food bank situation that's... Uh, happened in your parish, in our parish, which is in a, I would say, a, a middle to higher income area of Edmonton, but the demand for the food bank inside our church has grown tremendously, tremendously over the last few months, because so many people are out of work or underemployed or have had business problems. And, uh, 
And uh, I've been hearing from uh, volunteers working there, like, here's what we need. We really need a lot of stuff. And it's, it's made me feel pretty good. It gives me something to do to, to drop by the church for a few minutes once or twice a week and, and see, okay, what supplies do they need kind of thing. So that's something that kind of is, it, I find it really rewarding to kind of be able to do that because it kind of says, ah, there's something I could do to be helpful during this, this terrible time. And these are people that need help, but it's not, it doesn't really involve a lot of effort or a lot of money. It's just, it's just a little thing that you can do. Mm -hmm. And uh, that brings me to the last question. Um, this is addressed to everybody. So I'll go through your names individually. Uh, but uh, in terms of, um, it doesn't have to be specifically technology related because we are using technology right now to communicate this. Uh, but how, what are the best um, examples of the church reaching out um, either by living the gospel or sharing the gospel or church communities or individuals reaching out to people um, during this time? Uh, we'll start with um, Father Ferros. Yes, uh, just before I answer that question, I just wanted to add a uh, small sentence to the previous question and to our first speakers. Uh, I think in answering your question was uh, media helps us to amplify the message. Uh, but again, as uh, both the speakers said earlier, faith is a shared experience lived in a community. And that is something very fundamental expression of Christian faith. Uh, and um, yes, coming to this question, I think uh, this is something that is uh, very interesting uh, to go forward that we need to endorse good practices. And one of the good practice that I saw in this time of pandemic is uh, volunteers. You know, the church needed volunteers during a critical point of time. And those people showed up, took the courage to be those frontline workers for the church to be there. I think that trend to sign up for volunteership shows the commitment that people had for the church. And I think the more volunteers increase, um, the church will increase. Cool. Volunteers. Uh, and uh, John? So, um, you know, when we talk about the the church reaching out. Uh, I kind of want to dovetail off of what Father Feroz said earlier. When uh, when we talk about the church reaching out to the people, that's not just a job. That's for our priests and for that that brick building called the church over there. We're the church, and so when we're you know when you talk about in the time of pandemic or you know what are the best examples of the church reaching out? I think it's I think it's when we continue to strive to create those authentic communities and engage and invigorate and evangelize to people despite the pandemic or, or maybe look at new creative things. Um, you're asking for, for some examples and, you know, in schools, uh, part of the, part of the usual thing in Catholic schools is we have these celebrations of liturgies and, you know, in the, the anybody that went to a Catholic school, you remember walking into the gymnasium and seated with your class and we're going to have the Thanksgiving liturgy all together. Well, you know, the pandemic forced us to kind of rethink that whole thing. And, and we have seen some wonderful, wonderful creative examples of churches working together with schools, creating broadcast liturgies, doing live stream things where you cut to one classroom who's going to do this piece of the liturgy, cut to another group that's doing something else. We've seen um, very, very creative solutions to this idea of being able to give continuity to this idea of celebrating liturgies. But we've also gotten feedback, and I've, I've gotten feedback from, from teachers who have said, one of the great things is, is that students are more attentive to the liturgy now. They're not sure it's because we're doing something new, so it's novel. Maybe we got a novelty effect that we're working with. But they're, they're also saying, we've been forced to kind of strip away some of the trappings and come right back down to the good news. So the liturgy is really becoming about uh, the liturgy. And it's, it's not necessarily about the decorations you put up in the gym. It's about being attentive to the word and being attentive to the homily and celebrating together. We've heard from principals who are saying, we have way more parents tuning into our liturgies now before yeah. they had to come to the school. Now they can just log in at their desk or where they're working at home and they can spend 40 minutes celebrating with us together. And those are great examples, I think, of how we're, how we're doing those things. 
Um, Father Ferro also talked about volunteering. And a big push for us too is that we do best as a community when we look to the needs of others before our own. And so we're really, really concerned in schools right now about, okay, in a time of COVID, how do we do, how do, we do social justice? How do we do service learning? How do we do it safely? And how, but how do we do it in an engaging way that says to our students, you have something to give. There's a world out there that's hungry for what you can give to them right now. And that's that idea of connection. And that's the good news. Uh, Constable and one. Um, what John said is amazing and that's, that's so true. I, I think um, for me, um, my, my passion, my pa talent's been with technology and, and connection, how I, I envision as if, you know, somebody that would volunteer at the time would be, again, to assist those that may be um, in marginal or uh, possibly not have all the right equipment or maybe not necessarily the technology to, to interact and to get part of this. Um, because at the end of the day, I, I think in a time like this, uh, during COVID and pandemic, uh, spiritual nourishment is really important and trying to get to those like the marginalized is so important. And I think uh, um, enabling, like whether it's volunteering through uh, helping those who may not know how to use a computer or use technology to engage with the community is a it's a big volunteer thing that you could help out simple whether you actually need to call or do a walkthrough and how to like for example my parents who are elder and technology is not very good with them but so a lot of patient and getting them to use you know, a video chat is difficult, but as, as, you know, as trying to cheat somebody that's all foreign and new is, is you need to able, enable them to do that in order to participate, I guess. Um, and having said that, I think some of the parish's uh, websites uh, are dated and, and difficult information to get. I think if we can enable something fundamental as simple ability to allow people to gather the information they need or to access it, then, then it makes it that easier for those people. If, I, if I'm trying to understand, I think you just need to make it so something we all know what a website is, we all know people can attend a website. If we have those local parishioner who, uh, rely on the church or rely on them as a spiritual leader, then we need to have those uh, easy access to, to the people. So if I go to a website looking for some uh, service, I, I want to be able to get that information easily. And for somebody who may not know all technology, you want to make that as simple as possible. I think that's where the volunteer or the time that could be used to dedicate uh, to make it easier for those. If that makes any sense there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, information technology includes uh, being able to find the information, right? So that's exactly. uh, definitely very important. Um, Tim? I think what's important is that we don't, uh, we don't demonize uh, the new technology, the better technology, but at the same time, we don't idealize it as well. And that's, that, that finding that balance is, is going to be a big issue. But in terms of what we could do, well, I think these panel discussions, a series of panel discussions, is an excellent example. Maybe 10 or 15 or 20 years ago, we would have asked people to come to a parish hall or, or Newman College uh, every Tuesday for seven or eight weeks in a row and take in a panel discussion, and you're going to get a limited audience of, of fewer than 100 people. Now you can reach thousands of people in every part of Canada, in every part of the world, and they can take in these panel discussions at their own leisure. Maybe they can binge watch watch three or four on a Sunday morning or something like that. As I also mentioned earlier, you know, can we be more proactive as Father is with getting the message out from our own parish, not just that weekly newsletter from the Archdiocese, but something from our own parish, can we, can we be proactive in that way and, uh, uh, you know, push more out, I guess, in, in terms of things. But at the same time, I, I think we've got to look at the long term. Um, uh, when, we, when this is over, and it will end sometime, I think it's really important to get people back to uh, in-person attendance at church, in-person events, meetings, and other events in our parishes. 
We also need our, our, our priests to speak out and the archdiocese to speak out about the misuse and the abuse and the overuse of, of technology because while it's a wonderful thing, I think we've all agreed that there's got to be a balance and particularly with the, with, with the, the younger population who, you know, uh, I don't know how many times I've been out at a restaurant and a nice, this is before the pandemic because nobody's going to restaurants now and there's a young couple sitting at the table next to you having a wonderful dinner and they both got their phones out for, for the whole hour, an hour and a half, not talking to each other about what they're going to order or what's going on in their lives. And I just think, Sometimes it's it's sad and sometimes it's almost tragic what's going on out there. So there has to be that balance. There's a lot of great things as we've all discussed about this about this new technology, but there's there's a lot of downside, and we we need I think we think we need a message from the church about that because I think that's a great way to get everyone's attention, younger and older. Mm -hmm. I think it's uh, in the book of Sirach, but um, there's a there's a proverb in there that uh, really speaks to me, um, and it's about money, but it can be applied mm -hmm. to technology. Uh, so the the proverb is, uh, um, you know, don't give me too much money, Lord, uh, so that uh, I forget you, and don't give me too little money um, that I don't focus on you. Uh, it's the same way. Uh, technology is a tool. Uh, you know, make sure that we're not overusing technology, but make sure that we are using technology in a way. Um, that uh, gives glory to his name. And uh, like Paul says, set things on things that are above. Uh, St. Paul, sorry. Uh, I was uh, from a Baptist background. Uh, so uh, if anybody would like to, uh, to the viewers out there, if uh, you'd like to provide the bishops with comments or feedback on this topic, uh, please note that there is a feedback option on the website. We'd love to receive your thoughts here. Um, and uh, we want to conclude, oh wait, uh, just a reminder that next week there we do have a last reflection um, panel on the value and dignity of human work. Um, and prayer is so important. And I've been joining um, every two weeks uh, on my charismatic prayer group. Uh, we come together, we have a Bible study, and then we pray together. So uh, let's end in prayer today. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Almighty and eternal God a refuge in every danger, to whom we turn in our distress, in faith we pray. Look with compassion on the afflicted, grant eternal rest to the dead, comfort to mourners, healing to the sick, peace to the dying, strength to healthcare workers, wisdom to our leaders, and the courage to reach out to all in love, so that together we may give glory to your holy name. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you forever in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. St. Saint, Saint Francis of Seville, pray for us. Uh, St. Francis, oh, St. Isidore of Seville, pray for us. St. Francis de Sales, pray for us. And Blessed Carlo Acuti, pray for us. Um, thank you so much, um, everybody on the panel. Thank you for your time and your, uh, and your wisdom and insight today. And have a blessed week. Mm -hmm.